Welcome back artists, I'm Wyatt Paints, and today I'm back to painting scary stuff. So my longtime client and horror fan asked me, hey Wyatt, would you mind doing something full size? And I was like, sure, I could do something full size, life size, let's do it. And he sent me over the files to a life size predator arm holding a trophy skull. Whew, this is a big project. Probably the biggest project I've made for this channel. With over two kilograms of filament and almost as much resin, this is a record breaker. This is easily the largest hybrid sculpture I've done on the channel. In fact, I'll have to leave it in several pieces just to ship it across the country. But don't let the size of a project demotivate you. So long as we take it section by section <laughs> and remember the fundamentals, you'll have a life-size predator trophy for you as well. Now, I want to apologize. I've been gone for a couple of weeks, but you know, life happens like that. Hopefully, we're back on track. But for now, I'm going to hunt down my tools and head over to my painting table. Let's get started. Now, even though I'm going to be keeping this in multiple pieces for shipping, there are some seams that need a bit of attention. So I hit them with a bit of plastic putty. This stuff is great for small seams like this. The narrow applicator makes it really easy to lay down a thin bead along the trail. Then I just smooth it down running a wet finger across it, being sure not to press too hard. Doing so will leave you with a divot, which is not ideal. If this happens, just go back over the seam with a second pass of putty. This time, don't smooth it down and wait for it to dry. Then gently sand it smooth. Once the seams were looking good, I grabbed some Tamiya Basic Putty for some surface work. Even with a dialed in FDM printer, surfaces curved along the Z axis will suffer from layer lines and stepping. I like to take a two part approach in getting rid of them. I call it fillet and sand them. In the fillet step, I use epoxy like this to fill all the negative space in each step. Personally, I find using my fingers to be the most intuitive for this. But since you really don't want to get this stuff on your skin, gloves are a must. Just add a few dabs wherever you see the lines and spread it and smooth it with your finger. Natural surfaces like rocks are very forgiving when it comes to surface texture. So try not to overthink it and just cover any spot that looks rough. Looking back on this project, I ended up using about a tube and a half of this, so I might want to find a more economical way of doing this. If you have any suggestions for products I can use for this, let me know in the comments. After the putty dried, I gave it all a light sanding and a quick prime in the spray booth. Flat black for the arm, hand and base, and gloss black for the blades and gauntlet. With that all dry, the first thing I want to paint is the logo. And I'm thinking something reminiscent of the original movie poster with a sinister red. And then bring in the jungle theme by highlighting it up through orange and yellow, sort of like a setting sun. To start us off, flesh blood red. Now, I wanted a sinister red for this, and well, this is sinister. It's bright enough to give that fresh blood vibes but when layered over black, it shows a more diabolic side. This kind of soft blending technique is technically possible with a brush, but when you compare the skill needed to pull it off, the airbrush is hands down the winner. It took me about 15 minutes to lay down four passes, that gave me the nice smooth transition from the bright red to the shadow. Next up, orange ink. I haven't used too many inks on this channel, and if you haven't used them before, think of them as a really opaque washes. When sprayed through an airbrush, you can use them to tint the underlying color. Here, I wanted to start defining the area where my sun is coming in, and I want it somewhere in the middle, just not in the center. So for now, I'm only aiming to dust from the E to the O, with just a kiss on each of the R's, while also being careful to restrict it to just the top half of the letters. It was a good idea for me to stop before any of the letters start actually looking orange. I want them to still be red, just a really heavy lean into the orange. After a few minutes to dry, it was ready for the final highlight of yellow ink. 
At this point, I decided the sum was coming down between the A and the T. It's slightly off-center, and there's a reason for it. Whenever I see symmetry in something that overall doesn't have symmetry, it's deeply unsatisfying. It's kind of like the mental splinter you get when you see a misplaced tile in an otherwise perfect floor. And once I see it, I'm distracted from the rest of the piece. Plus, being slightly askew is objectively more interesting. When it's slightly off-center, it becomes a question of why the artist did it that way. Compared to if I put it in the center, the answer to that question is easy, because it's in the middle. It's a small detail, but that's what art can be. A series of small details that become greater than the sum of their parts. After a few minutes to dry, it was time for the arm to get some attention. Now I wanted to give it a pearlescent top coat as an interpretation of the Predator's cloaking ability. For that I'm going to be using Chameleon Mica Powder. This one in particular is called Spicy Cocktail and it shifts from green to purple. The purple is kind of hard to see due to the glare, but the green is showing off greatly. I sprayed it over just black so you can have a chance to see what it does. With the top coat test over, I grabbed Camel Bright Green to lay down the undercoat. I was careful to feather this green into the areas I wanted shadow as the black primer underneath will create a tone shift using the transparency of their acrylic paint. Any areas not intended to be in shadow got a second pass to get full opacity. Next for a quick highlight with Dungeon Slime. I restricted this to only upper parts of the muscle and kept it very light mainly to continue the contouring around the shaded areas I had already started. But I didn't want this to be too bright, because the Predator is, well, a Predator. I don't want his highlights to be too poppy. After drying, it still looked a little bit bright and I wanted to knock him down a bit. So a bit of black green ink is just what I need. Starting from the deepest shadow areas to reinforce them, like along the main seam and then the dips of the muscles, I then followed this with an all over misting to step down the highlights just a touch and normalize everything to a slightly darker green. After I was done, I clear coated everything to hit the save button. While the base dries, it's time to start working on that trophy skull and spine. And once again, to me a basic poly is called into action. I had to treat the top surface of the bones to fill in the nastier layer lines. But they all will also need a touch of sanding to smooth them out. Again, with natural surfaces, you get a lot of wiggle room with how smooth you need to get it. Besides, I'll be covering these with blood later, so any minor lines that survive won't be noticeable. And since I'm sanding, I figured I'd give the wrist blades a once over. While they look very smooth, unpainted resin can hide a lot of surface imperfections from you. And I plan on chroming these blades out, so a little bit of extra time here to make sure they're extra smooth will pay off later. After getting rid of all that dust, the bones got a quick prime and flat black. And then I gave the blades a coat in gloss black. With all the rattle cam painting, it seemed like a good time to base up the gauntlet as well, using metallic finish. Now if you want nice reflective results with this stuff, I have three words for you. Thin, thin, thin. As in you want to try to not get full opacity until your third coat. So my first pass here is a very thin dusting of silver. As you can see, it's still mostly black. Then I give it a full minute in front of the fan to drop before it gets a second dusting, again trying to avoid getting full coverage here, as you can still see speckles of the primer showing through. After another dry cycle, it was ready for its final coat. But again, this is a dusting. Following these techniques and taking your time, you can lay down perfect metallics every time. While the metallics dry, I figured this is a good time to take a moment to thank my subscribers over on Patreon. Your monthly support keeps the paint flowing and I can't thank you enough. This month with your support, I was able to make my final 99 cent store ramen run to get all of my favorite nudes. You shall be missed 99 cent store.
If you would like to help support the channel, you'll find a link to my Patreon in the description below. Or you can check out my Amazon links to purchase some of the products used in the video, and the channel will earn a small commission. Or, or, you can save that money and hit that like and subscribe button. For now, let's get back to that arm. With the bones now dry, they were ready for oak brown. This was mainly to serve as the shadow color on the bones as opposed to black, so the only control needed here is to not overspray to leave drip marks. Thankfully, the spine pieces had these articulating pins that I could hold on to while painting. While technically these could be painted, these parts will be well hidden from view, plus with all the motion would probably scuff off any paint we put here anyways. So the black shadow is going to be good enough. I just had to look out not to paint the connecting side. Not only will it interfere with the glue to hold the parts together, but that's also where I numbered them to keep track of which piece goes where. With the bones drying in the spray booth, I jumped over to my painting table to start on those rocks with black and tan craft paint. The first step, blacking them all out. I'm gonna need to abuse my brush here a bit, so this calls for Bristly to make an appearance in this video. This step is important to mask away any overspray from the mica powder top coat. Otherwise, I risk having some sparkly rocks. With everything blacked out, I mixed in some tan to create a highlight. I chose tan here to keep the grays of the rocks warm rather than cold. This way it ties together well with the title, but also adds a bit of contrast to the cooler greens of the arm. I put this on as a rough dry brush over the larger volumes and ignored the cracks and valleys. Once dry, I felt it could use a touch more, so I mixed in a little bit more tan in the black and gave it a dusting to the more high detail areas across the peaks. I also gave a little bit extra attention to the front facing side. You gotta know where your eyes are gonna be. Now it's time to address the insignia with a personal favorite, gunmetal. Gunmetal always seems to thread the needle for me. It's bright enough to read as metal, but dark enough to disappear at the right angle. Plus, with a surface like this, it won't take much to look its best. I focused on keeping this on the top surface of the raised detail, and the thin application ended up using the layer lines of the filament print to my advantage as it took on a brushed aluminum appearance. I liked it so much, I left it without a highlight. Sometimes things just work out like that. Best not to push my luck. But I am gonna shade it with Nullin Oil. For the metallics, I kept this mainly to the cracked details as not to mess with that grain pattern I got. Then I switched focus to the title. In my head, I kind of wanted the letters to fade to black at the bottom, so I might as well start that off with some oil in the cracks. I'm not going to get to full black from this wash, but it starts the transition while also adding better visibility to the surface cracks. To finish off the lettering in the shadows, it's time for matte black. The goal here is to black out the edges of the letters to help give the title a bit more separation from the black ground rocks while also cleaning up any of the overspray of the orange. But the most important thing to do here is to paint clean. While it takes longer and is a bit tedious, it's nothing compared to having to repaint all this lettering. So go slow and don't stop until it's done.
After spending so much time on the base, I grabbed that tan and went back to the bones. Now, while I normally would be telling you how the very matte finish of this paint leads to a very cool final look, that wouldn't really work for this. My client wanted a freshly extracted level of gore, so the bones are going to be a bit wetter. This is why I'm also using such a dark shade. Bone really doesn't get too bright unless it's been cleaned or sun bleached. Here, I'm applying it with a bit of a hybrid stipple and dry brush. I only want full coverage on the top surface. This will help hide any minor layer lines that remain. And on the sides, a rough dry brush stipple at 70% hides all the straight line patterns from the sidewall layer lines. For the skull, I started with a medium dry brush. This lets me control the intensity of the shadows by slowly building up the bone color. Key points here are to make sure to get solid coverage outlining the key fixtures of the face. This will do a lot to improve the readability from a distance. When it comes to the crown, while I'm looking for high coverage, I don't want to overdo it and wash out all the cool pits and surface detail. You only really want to get 100% coverage on the very smooth spots. Anywhere else, there should be some amount of that brown undercoat showing through. While the bones dried, I headed back to the spray booth to work on the hand. Starting again with that bright camo green. Here, I'm looking to not only base the fishnet area to match the bicep, but also lay down a bit of a green undercoat for the skin of the fingers. While doing research for this project, I found out that predators come in a wide range of colors and spot patterns. So for this predator, I want to have this as my undertone. Green undertones for skin always look very alien to me, so I think it'll work here. For the skin's main color, Desert Stone. When spraying fingers like this, if you control your spray angle, you won't really need a mask. And since I still needed to do more painting over the fishnet, I wasn't too concerned with overspray but I did keep my spraying pretty reserved to keep the cleanup to a minimum. The majority of my focus is on slowly building up the color evenly and letting it feather to the green in the creases. Next, to reinforce those shadows, charred brown. To keep things easy for myself, I went ahead and just ringed each finger at the base and any of the creases of the inner hand. Then I made some light patchy stripes running parallel with the scale pattern. And in no time at all, the skin was already feeling alive. I did have a bit of an oopsie with overspray, but I can go back and clean it up with the desert stone no problem. This is also when I realized I forgot to paint those two openings on the knuckles. But no worries, I took care of it, I just didn't record it. After the knuckles were painted, I switched back to the charred brown and turned down the air pressure on my compressor to about 12 psi, so that it'd be spitting out little speckles of cover for a bit of freckling. I liberally applied this all over the fingers and the knuckles. Once dry, the randomness this speckling gives helps it feel more natural. After clear coating for protection, it was time to mask up all the skin and paint up that fishnet. While I go through the same process as I did on the bicep of light camo green, highlight, shade, and then chameleon powder top coat, I think I should address something. Now, I know many of you may have some questions about how I'm handling this, especially since in the movie, it's literally a fishnet shirt that he's wearing. To put it simply, painting fishnets suck and usually they look really bad. This is because humans are really good at recognizing patterns. So if you're off by just a little bit, the whole thing looks bad. And that's not something I wanna risk on a commission. 
<laughs> there was a fever dream five minutes where I thought about actually gluing down some black fishnet, but I wasn't sure if the molded fishnet would interfere with the look or if I can even get it super close fitting without covering the whole thing in glue. So me and my client landed on the shimmer effect. Now since I use gloss varnish as the medium for the mica powder, I won't have to clear coat this and once it's dried, I put a second level of masking to isolate the backhand armor. This got the same treatment as the gauntlet. A candy coat of gloss black primer, followed by three dustings of metallic finish. Just like the gauntlet, it came out shining. Speaking of the gauntlet, it's time to do some of those details. So I grabbed bited gold and bright bronze. I ended up not liking how the solid gold looked, so ignore it. After thinning them down a bit, I went around looking for things to pick out here and there, just being sure to be consistent with Rabita details. Now it's time to do some general shading and weathering with Nullin Oil. The first goal here is to put a dark haze line around each detail. This makes sense as these interactive features would collect dirt and grime around the raised rims. This goes double for the bolt heads. I then added a bit of shading to all the dented and battle scarred areas. This won't be a final shading so I don't want to go too heavy, just a bit of hazing. Then finally, a bit of an all over misting. This is to knock down the shininess of the metal. I imagine the Predator would want to dirty this up on purpose as to not stand out while they're on the hunt. The backhand armor got a similar once over shading as well. I have one more job to do before I leave the spray booth. Chroming the blades with Alclad Chrome 107. Two things to know about this paint. One is expensive. This bottle is 19 bucks, so pricey, very pricey. And it's kind of temperamental. It takes special care for it to look its best. Know that this is a lacquer paint, so you're gonna need white spirits or 99 proof IPA to clean it from your airbrush. Also, it's super thin, so you'll wanna turn down your brush pressure to the low side. Think around 12 to 14 PSI, and always be on the move. If you stay in one spot too long, it'll build up and look patchy really fast. But to be perfectly honest, you can get similar results by just rubbing graphite powder into a gloss prime coat. But doing it this way does have the added benefit of not rubbing off on clothes and also you can clear coat this. I'm not going to because it's going to mess with the finish, but I could if I wanted to. With the mask removed from the hand, I started with charred brown to base all the scales. Key points to remember here is that when you're painting over a gloss finish with an acrylic paint, it's going to lead to some coverage issues. So I expected this to take at least two to three coats before I could move on. While I was at it, I painted the straps as well. I took extra care to make sure I had a clean edge. Once dry, it was looking good. Time for a highlight of leather brown. To begin with, I used a small round brush to stiff stipple onto each arbor plate. I wanted this to cover about 70% of each section. And since I want these to be more organic, like it was made from some kind of shell rather than synthetic, I wasn't concerning myself with uniformity, just that they were generally centered. Just like with a soft dry brush, you can build up layers of stippling to increase the intensity. You just need to wait for the layer to fully dry, otherwise you risk ripping up the previous layer. Having a fan nearby can help speed up this wait time and improve your painting time efficiency. I then use that same brown on the belt. By keeping strokes parallel to each other but perpendicular to the band, I was able to simulate light cracks from repeated flexing fairly simply. For a final highlight, leather brown number two. This leather brown is a bit more yellow than the first, so it serves as a pretty good highlight, while still being undeniably brown. But I kept this fairly light, just a few taps until I can see the shift, and then stop.
Now to give the hand the Nolan Nolan treatment of detailed shadows. Every bolt, distinct line, and seam got addressed. Then I switched over to the gala, and again, every line and scar got at least two passes of oil. I also stippled some into the dented areas to add a bit more visual interest, as there isn't much to look at in the term of model details. If a spot ever looked to be a little bit too much, a quick dab with my finger turned it into a subtle wear and tear marking. Finally, I grabbed some black to finish off the gauntlet by painting the small touch screen. The hardest thing here was to comfortably hold the gauntlet while not messing up my previous work. And for being just six black rectangles, this took way longer than I was expecting. But the finish line was coming and there was no stopping me now. With the finish fast approaching, it was time to assemble the spine. Usually I do assembly off screen, but this might be useful as a guide. While the instructions that came with the SDL has an order for the bones, as they're each slightly different, I really couldn't tell by sight which was which, so I just ordered them generally in ascending to largest and then back down to smallest. Sorting them out now is gonna save me a ton of time during building. Now to build it, starting with the end cap, you wanna put the loop of the lower bone on the peg of the ascending bone's bottom half, then glue on its top half. I repeated this all the way up to the top, but I left off the last one, as you need to close it around the skull peg at the same time. But in the meantime, look how wiggly it is. So wiggly! Now I'm going to stop the video right here to be as gore free as possible. If you want to see how I'm going to be adding all the gore bits, I should be uploading another video soon. I would just rather that this video didn't get flagged for contact. So look for that one soon. This is the safe for work version. Although, if you're watching YouTube at work, I doubt they will mind what it is. <laughs> this is still in multiple pieces as it needs to be shipped, so I won't be able to have it holding the skull. But even still, whoo, this was a challenging project. I, just, I did not realize just how much would have to go into something like this and really underestimated the size of it. It's so big I couldn't even put it on my turntable. As it sits, it's over two kilograms of filament and a kilogram and a half of resin plus a lot of hours of painting. I hope my client likes it, and I hope all of you enjoyed this video. Once I get it blooded up, it'll be time to pack it up and ship it out and start the next project. Now I know I missed the last two weeks, that's because these kind of projects burn up your time. I gotta get to my next project, so as always, thank you for watching, stay creative, and always enjoy the process.